this is Earth, your world. Or maybe I should be saying you are the Earth's, not the other way around. Let's face it, it did create us. But how was the Earth created? Well, it all starts with dust. Around 4.6 billion years ago, this newborn star emerges, orbited by a dust cloud called an accretion disk. At the center, gravity is pulling gases together, forming a protostar. But they pull so tightly that they ignite. This is our sun. We're going to be focusing on the creation of Earth and how Earth will eventually be destroyed. I am John Joe, and if you're interested in these videos, then subscribe. It's free. Right now, there is no Earth here yet. In fact, the planets we know haven't even formed at this stage. But gravity will pull these dust particles into rocks, and the larger these rocks become, the more that they attract. After millions of years, gravity will have allowed these rocks to take larger forms. Planets, hundreds of planets at this point in time, and the surface of Earth would be exploding with a barrage of impacts. The temperature here now is over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmosphere would only consist of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and water vapour. Survival here would be outright impossible. Without yet having a solid surface, all there is is a planetary ocean of lava. So how does this planet become the Earth that we know today? Well, let's find out. Jupiter is considered a failed star, and is thought to have slowly moved inward, disrupting the orbits of many celestial objects. One of which is a small, younger planet about the size of Mars, known as Thea, which is now heading at 10 miles per second straight towards the Earth. As it approaches, gravity distorts the surface of both planets until they collide. It was once thought that this collision happened at a much further distance away, helping to create the asteroid belt. However, it is now believed the asteroids there were never once part of a planet. In this collision, both planets nearly annihilated each other, shattering Earth's crusts and throwing tons of debris into orbit. This turned into Earth's rings, but after a thousand years with gravity, the largest of the rocks grew and collected all of the rubble, clearing out Earth's rings. How do we know that this happened this far back in time? While well, the rocks from this ring joined together over time and became our moon. Currently the moon's distance is at around 384,400 kilometers away, but at this point in history it was only 22,500 kilometers or 14,000 miles away. But the moon isn't the only thing different here. The sun rises in the morning and will set in only three hours. The entire day is only six hours long because the Earth is spinning much faster than it does today. At this stage, the Earth is beginning to cool down, but this is a process that will take millions of years. Although some scientists believe that water may have came earlier, it is generally believed that most of the water, if not all of it, came just under four billion years ago, where Earth was once again bombarded by meteors. Those left over from when the solar system formed, this shower of meteors lasted for 20 million years. And because of these meteors' water supply, this event became vital to one day harboring life on Earth. And despite such small quantities of water in each meteor, while over 20 million years, these droplets became oceans, now that the atmosphere is around 170 degrees. It's cooled just enough to form the crust. Just think about that for a moment. Whenever you have a glass of water, it may have been on Earth for billions of years after traveling the cosmos just for us to drink it. It has been theorized that life was evolving during this event on Earth, which is actually a problem at this point in time because some of these comets that impacted the Earth were so large and hit with such force that the surrounding water would have instantly evaporated. 
any form of solid land that unlikely existed at the time would have melted and the earth would have been entirely sterilized. So how could life have existed and carry on evolving? Well, these impacts not only gave to the earth, but also took from it as well. With the larger impacts, earth rocks were sent into space carrying microbial life, only to seed the earth again later. We have potential evidence for this, in the evolution of some microbial life. The International Space Station stored some microbes on the outside, completely exposed to space and cosmic radiation. And they survived. But why? On Earth, they don't need to survive the environment of space. But I guess that's because we're thinking of now. But this early on in Earth's life, it may have been essential to be able to survive these conditions, and which also brings up the possibility of panspermia, where microscopic organisms wasn't created on Earth, but Earth was seeded by alien microbes from one of these comets that bombarded Earth so many years ago. Although the idea of panspermia has yet to be fully proven or disproven, this is not the widely accepted time of when life started on Earth. That comes a bit later. At this moment in time, whether life could have existed or not, this is still a dangerous world with megastorms unlike anything we've ever seen before. These megastorms are the result of Earth's extremely fast rotation. With the moon being so close to Earth, ocean tides run wild. It's chaos for the moment. But after about 100 million years, the moon moves further away, calming down the oceans, and the storms subside while the rotation of Earth is slowed down by the moon's influence. The oceans may have calmed down now, but beneath the water, violence ensues. With volcanoes erupting on the ocean floor, spewing out molten rock that solidifies, forming volcanic islands that rise up through the ocean. These volcanic islands eventually join together, becoming continents. Although this is starting to resemble the planet that we can recognize, the atmosphere and temperature is still very hostile to life. Don't worry too much though, as this is all about to change. The Earth becomes bombarded with meteorites again. Something may have disturbed our solar system's asteroid belt, but these meteors are carrying with them more water, and this time, as they fall into the oceans, they begin to dissolve, releasing carbon and primitive proteins like amino acids to the ocean. This is a very dark and cold place, but even down here there's something amazing about to happen. The ocean water seeps down into the crust of the earth and is then spewed back out into the ocean bringing with them more minerals and gases in the form of boiling hot liquid. To which the minerals solidify, forming towers. And not only that, but this boiling ejection of mineral soup is where life is believed to have began. No one truly knows how life was actually created in this soup, but somehow the waters here are suddenly full of microscopic single-celled bacteria. And these may very well be your oldest relatives. These single-celled bacteria ruled the Earth for hundreds of millions of years before other forms of more complex life started to appear. In the shallower parts of the ocean, places that light can actually reach, strange-looking rocks form just under the surface of the water. But these are not rocks. They are actually colonies of living bacteria called stromatolites, which have developed a talent that we call photosynthesis. Using the sunlight with carbon dioxide and water, it creates its own food, glucose, which is a type of sugar. And this process is achieving something that we, with all of our technology, are still far from achieving. And that is terraformation of an entire planet by creating oxygen as a byproduct. In the water, the oxygen causes the traces of iron in the water to rust and fall to the floor, creating an iron-rich layer that we humans will one day utilize. But above the water, oxygen transforms the planet's atmosphere over the course of two billion years, which will be vital for life to evolve, becoming even more complex creatures further down the line. By this time, days have become much longer, about 16 hours all around. 
The earth shines blue with volcanic islands. It seems peaceful, but it's not all as it seems. Because the heat under the earth's surface has created cracks in the crust. These are the tectonic plates and the heat from the core is powering them to move. Taking the oceans and islands around the world, now it seems that the earth itself is a living organism, commanding the face of its surface to its will. The volcanic islands have crashed into each other, getting bigger with each collision, even causing mountains to raise from the ground, and the very first supercontinent is formed. It is called Rodinia, which comes from the Russian word Rodina, meaning motherland or birthplace. Days on Rodinia have become 18 hours long and the temperature is 85 degrees. But this is still just a rocky planet and life has yet to reach the land. Unfortunately, Rodinia was never inhabited by any forms of life and the tectonic plates were still moving. About 750 million years ago, the supercontinent Rodinia was split in half, separating further as time passed on and the ocean fills the void. The intense geological changes causes a spike in volcanic activity, releasing tons of greenhouse gases. Now you may be thinking that the earth is about to get incredibly hot, but you could not be further from the truth. You see this activity created acid rain as the carbon dioxide mixed with the water, and with the many exposed rocks from the splitting of the continent, the rain was then absorbed, locking in the carbon dioxide. As the atmosphere rapidly lost much of its carbon dioxide, Earth was not able to trap enough heat from the sun and the temperature quickly dropped to minus 60 degrees, becoming desolate and frozen. This period in time has been referred to as Snowball Earth because of its extreme cold, duration, as well as massive glaciers thousands of feet high. As these glaciers cross more land, the more that sunlight is reflected away from the earth, speeding up the entire process, until another glacier arises from the opposite direction, and the north and the south pole collide, crashing together at the equator, covering the entire planet in a sheet of ice, 10,000 feet tall. All of the light the earth now receives is almost completely reflected back into space. It may seem this should have been the end of Earth, but there is hope. The core of the planet is still hot, and it's getting hotter, creating gases that are building up pressure beneath the ball for 15 million years. Throughout this time, volcanoes have occasionally burst through the ice. And only now, as more volcanoes erupt on the surface, things begin to change. With the surface covered up in ice, the carbon dioxide cannot be absorbed and is therefore released into the atmosphere once again. Blanketing the planet to capture the heat from the sun, temperatures now rise after 15 million years. The ice slowly starts to melt, and as it does, more volcanoes are released from the ice and the rocky ground pushes up, causing more eruptions, increasing their effect on the ice, speeding up the process in the opposite way the ice caused to begin with. With the melting of the ice, the sun rays cause a chemical reaction with the water molecules in the ice, which creates hydrogen peroxide, an oxygen-rich chemical. This releases a massive quantity of oxygen into the atmosphere. The Earth is reborn and now a very different planet but wait, what happened to life here? Surely those microbial life forms could not have survived 15 million years under the ice that we called Snowball Earth. While millions of years after Earth is reborn, the days are about 22 hours long and the temperature is similar to our summer. Life is actually thriving in this perfect environment and our ancestors have grown under the water those primitive single-celled organisms have evolved over all of this time. About 540 million years ago, in our oxygen-rich oceans of the Cambrian period, we now see plants on the seafloor, along with armored slugs, 
trilobites, worms, sea scorpions, and Anomalocaris that easily hunted trilobites by grabbing them with their appendages and flipping them onto their backs. As trilobites had no way to right themselves, the Anomalocaris helped itself to the exposed underbelly. Some of these newly evolved creatures have developed a skeletal structure, one of which being this fish, a pachaea, which could have been the first vertebrae, another potential ancestor of ours. And it's because of these sorts of creatures that you have a spine that supports your body. So there is no extinction here, and life is exploding at this period, which has also been called the Cambrian Explosion because of the such diverse life that we find here. A new supercontinent emerges around 460 million years ago, called Gondwana, or Gondwana Land. Technically not a full supercontinent because there were some places, like Siberia, which are actually separate from it. But still, the land is not inhabited yet, except for a few groups of algae, despite the planet being almost complete as we see it today. Well, almost. The problem at this point in time for life wasn't the planet, it was the sun. The sun is blasting Earth with deadly radiation, so ocean life was fine, but on the land they didn't stand a chance. Luckily for us, the Earth is readying its defence, with a high concentration of oxygen provided by bacteria and the glacier's retreat. That same deadly radiation is causing a reaction from the oxygen in our atmosphere, turning it into a gas that we call ozone, which will form a protective shield around our planet, absorbing the radiation. After 120 million years of this process, the planet is now protected, and life has a chance to step out of the ocean for the very first time. The first to appear on land are small, mossy groups of plant life aiding in the defence of our planet by providing plenty more oxygen. And we begin to see a new creature in the waters, unlike anything before it, swimming with fins, but not just any old fins. The Tik Talik has bony fins. It developed this trait to help it walk on land. It uses its neck to help lift itself out of the water and uses its fins like legs. It's not the most graceful of walkers, but it is considered to be the first to walk on land, and that is one of the key moments of our most ancient ancestors. Over millions of years, this creature, and others alike, spent more and more time out of the water, because plant life was abundant on land, and the more time they spent out of the water, the more they'll adapt to life on land which is when four-legged vertebrates called tetrapods came to be and from them evolved the dinosaurs, birds, mammals and then you. Plants up until this point had reproduced with spores requiring that they start life close to water but now they had evolved to use seeds a capsule containing all of the food and the water that they needed to get started miles away from any water source and they could survive this far out without water for years. As plants and trees spread across the land, it holds all of the water and nutrients that the unhatched baby needs. However, where there is life, there is also death. When the trees die, they fall onto the ground and without anything like fungus or termites, they just sat there, gathering. Eventually, they get covered by rocks and these dense layers are heated up by pressure and the Earth's core eventually becoming sheets of coal, which is all that remains of them. We are now entering the Permian period, where those lizards we spoke about before have evolved. Scutosaurs roam in herds grazing on plants, and they've grown big with armour, but for what? This creature is the Gorgonopsid. He is the apex predator at this time, and he has some lethal weapons, and its lethal weapons are sabre teeth which it uses them to attack and then wait for its prey to get weak from blood loss. However, walking is still in need of improvement. The Gorgonopsid hasn't quite got the bone structure yet to walk properly. It kind of wobbles along. But worse than this predator, the Earth is about to attack 
or life. The ground heats up as pressure builds. It's a flood of basalt eruption. Plumes of lava push up through the crust, not like a volcano. This is the mantle raising through the crust, killing almost all life in the local area. But this local event is about to set off a chain reaction known as the Great Dying, the Permian Extinction. Nothing has changed yet for the rest of Gogdwana. The temperature stays at about 70 degrees, but it seems to start snowing. But this is ashes falling from the sky, which suffocates life, coming from the basalt eruption 10,000 miles away. As sulfur dioxide levels soar in the atmosphere, then rain falls as acid, burning what is left. Now, carbon dioxide levels have also been risen, increasing the global temperature, destroying almost all life on land. Life in the oceans has mostly disappeared as well. Pockets of methane stuck under ice on the sea floor are released as higher temperatures melt the ice, changing the waters to become once again hostile towards life. This methane is then released into the atmosphere, which is 20% more effective than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. The waters begin to change colour to become pink with algae, the toughest to survive this new climate change. The temperature has actually risen to 105 degrees. This is an extinction event that almost sterilised the planet. More than 9 out of every 10 species on Earth was wiped out. Very few creatures survived, but those that did ate anything they could find and slept in caves or burrows. Ultimately, evolution of Earth's life took many steps back here, almost completely lifeless. Eventually, after 50 million years since the Great Dying, on the supercontinent of Pangaea, which even connects the North and South Pole on one long stretch of land. Temperatures begin to normalize and the land is fertile once again. Now the Earth is open for any creature to take over and it's the dinosaurs that rule these lands and will do so for over a hundred million years. Their story begins with the Triassic period. The dinosaurs that lived during this time was Drepanosaurs which looked kind of like a chameleon, but actually unrelated. Tanistrophias, whose neck stretched out as long as its body and tail combined. And the famous Dilophosaurs, a smaller frilled neck predator, which despite their portrayal in films, did not actually spit any form of acid at their prey. And a creature that dominated the waters was Ichthyosaurs. However, are technically not dinosaurs, they are aquatic reptiles. All of these creatures must have evolved from the reptiles that somehow survived the Permian extinction. However, their luck hasn't changed yet. The Earth's crust is still stretching, making it thinner and weaker at certain locations, releasing lava onto the land. The Earth's tectonic plates are moving again, breaking up Pangaea. Oceans flourish, but fish died naturally, building up layers we find in the ground today as oil and almost all of our oil was created this way. 180 million years ago, North America is still moving away from the European plate, traveling at the same rate our fingernails grow. Eventually breaking away from Africa, an ocean fills the land between them, and the crust itself splits, which heats up the water as lava spills through, creating mountains and a new ocean floor. Ichthyosaurs have been successful during this period, being a very agile and fast predator. But for them, things change when they stop being the hunter and start becoming hunted. Reptiles are not the only things living in this ever-changing, chaotic world. A small shrew-like mammal has been surviving in the shadow of the dinosaurs for over a hundred million years already. So small, it's almost been unnoticed, but here, Braving the enormous beasts is another of our ancestors. These shrew-like creatures were one of the many mammal lineages. Being nocturnal, they only ventured out at night to avoid the dinosaurs. 
Mammals was never really given the chance to evolve because of the dinosaurs' dominance, and despite what the Earth had already thrown at them, it seemed it was unlikely to ever change. Now, however, the dinosaurs are about to be attacked, but it seems nothing on Earth can threaten the dinosaurs' reign. This attack is coming from space. An asteroid six miles across is veered off course and travelling at 4,000 miles an hour. It is heading straight towards Earth. It impacts Earth at the Gulf of Mexico, immediately annihilating itself with an explosion equivalent to that of up to 921 billion Hiroshima A-bombs. Just minutes after impact, rocks as big as cities are raised up and fall back to Earth hundreds of miles away from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the Earth is bombarding itself. 99% of the force from the impact was repelled upwards whilst a mere 1% went into the Earth. But this was just enough to send seismic waves through the Earth, causing global earthquakes, tsunamis, and just for added extra measure, volcanic activity. As if all this wasn't enough, the ejector cloud travels at 16,000 kilometers an hour, sending a scorching heat around the Earth. Static electricity charges the clouds, creating electric storms. Quetzalcoatlus could maybe have escaped this for a short time. However, superheated rocks are raining down like hail. It doesn't take long for their wings to form too many holes that renders them unable to support flight, and they fall from the sky. On the other side of the planet, there was no warning, except for the rapidly raising temperature, increasing a few degrees every second, eventually reaching 70 degrees Celsius where survival expectations is only minutes, and that is reduced to seconds as temperature reached 90 degrees, and the peak in Mongolia reached 150 degrees Celsius. It is a wonder that anything survived. There is also several impact craters in the Deccan Traps in India, expected to have been dated to about the same time as this extinction, which caused 75% of all species to die out. Lava once again covers the land as ash and dust fill the sky. Temperature on Earth is now over 500 degrees. Any plant life left over will spontaneously combust. The dinosaurs are demoted, almost all of which go extinct. As with every extinction, all of this destruction will allow new species to evolve and the opportunity for new types of creatures to dominate, like mammals. Remember those shrew-sized mammals living underground and being scavengers, eating everything? They're used to the harsh life and have mostly avoided this destruction. A few million years later, the temperature has calmed and it's about 75 degrees. Each day is slightly under 24 hours long and the atmosphere is relatively normal. There are no signs of the dinosaurs, except their surviving ancestors, smaller birds and mammals are now taking over. A lemur looking creature has evolved, the most famous being Darwinius marsilia. Their brains have gotten bigger in comparison to their body size, and although it's uncertain, but it's believed that this creature evolved into monkeys, and then later us, another potential ancestor of ours. At this time, Everest is created by the Indian plate colliding very slowly with Asia, Usually, one plate will raise over the other, but in this case, both plates wanted to be on top. They start to buckle, and a vast mountain range called the Himalayas emerges. 20 million years ago, the planets finally look as recognisable as it does today. This is also about the time that Megalodon came to be, and the reason for this massive shark to have evolved is likely similar to that of the dinosaurs. Sharks have been around for 430 million years before this point. But now, over millions of years, mammals are even taking over the oceans 
and whales emerged 30 million years before this point as well. The first whales were smaller, as were the sharks, but whales only defence were their size, so sharks evolved to be bigger, and the whales evolutionary response was to make them bigger as well. And this started a repeating cycle of a deadly race for sheer size. Then we have the largest known shark to have ever existed, Megalodon. But size isn't everything. As blue whales evolved, they became the largest creature to have ever existed on the planet. And the Megalodon is thought to have been outcompeted for food by none other than the Great White Shark. Humans are thought to have originated in Africa as primates. With more geological activity, mountains grew between Africa and India blocking vital moisture, changing our ancestors' environment. Making the land hotter and desolate, this event is thought to be the reason our ancestors became bipedal, walking with two legs rather than on all fours. These creatures evolved into Homo erectus, another earlier form of humans, and they survived over one million years until woodlands changed into rainforests. 70,000 years ago, sea levels are lowering and Homo sapiens emerge. These form of humans are great explorers and it is thought that 200 of them crossed the Red Sea between Africa and Arabia. And this small group of Homo sapiens had reached every corner of the world. And with this group of Homo sapiens, every corner of the world was colonized by their descendants. However, Earth hasn't settled just yet. Just as Homo sapiens reach Europe, they find that it's getting colder in the middle of summer. Frozen water and dying plants that just can't survive the cold. CO2 levels and the warmer water currents are slowly changing the earth to become colder. High raised glaciers are expanding from the North Pole about a foot further each day. Neanderthals are considered to be our closest relatives. Spreading out from Europe to Central Asia and are thought to have been brutish and not intelligent. But this couldn't have been further from the truth. Nowadays it is believed that they made musical instruments and tools and were the first to do so out of bone. They were also the first to bury their dead with adorned grave sites and even had their own language. They survived during the Ice Age and they adapted to have their bodies shorter due to their ribs being closer to their pelvic bone and broader chest which allowed them to maintain and store more body heat. So Neanderthals were better suited to the harsher climates of the Ice Age than Homo sapiens. So why were they the ones to go extinct here? While it was believed that we, Homo sapiens, outcompeted them and outright killed them till their extinction. But again, we're not seeing the full picture here because now it seems it was more peaceful as both species co-inhabited and even bred together. With so few Neanderthals compared to Homo sapiens, many did die out, maybe in fights and outcompeted, but more likely on a clan-to-clan -clan basis, comprising of both species. Eventually, Neanderthals' numbers simply decreased too far, with a small gene pool merging with Homo sapiens' gene pool. Even now, our DNA shows that European and Asian people still have a 1 or 2% level of Neanderthal genes on average. Imagine if they didn't go extinct. It's quite possible that we would have two dominant species on Earth, both being technologically advanced. But don't worry too much about the Ice Age. This isn't going to become another snowball Earth. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sat there watching me talk about it. About 20,000 years ago, the glaciers stopped moving, and now the ice sheets are about one and a half miles overhead. With all this water locked up as ice, the sea levels lowered, revealing a pathway from Siberia to Alaska, a bridge for our ancestors to colonize America, which is the last massive expansion of Homo sapiens so far. As the ice melts, it leaves behind America's Great Lakes and the locks of Scotland and recedes back to the poles. Today, Homo sapiens are the dominant species on the planet with a bloody history of war ideology and religion. Here we are now watching videos on the internet. Science has advanced so far already
and the first car was invented in 1886. And then we went from riding horses and less than 100 years later, landing on the moon in 1969. So this is how we understand the history of Earth, leading to the present. Our tiny rock growing in space to a planet, the ball of lava that froze and thawed, where life evolved and was destroyed many times over. So, what happens next? Mars is our next step, and with the successful launch of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket and the safe landing of the fuel containers, humanity on Mars might actually be closer than you think. But why Mars first? Although the Moon is much closer, Mars's day and night cycle is 25 hours long, and has seasons. A year is 24 months, so it fits into our natural life cycle very well. Mars is almost a twin itself of Earth. But the benefits of the Moon would be that having an outpost on the Moon, which would supply fuel to the ships from Earth, would help make the rest of the solar system much more accessible. Because most of the fuel on any spacecraft is used up fighting Earth's gravity. For example, the Apollo 11 mission took 27 times the amount of fuel for takeoff than it did for the rest of the trip, including re-entering Earth. So the Moon should really be the first option long term, depending on accessibility of resources. And then after Mars, eventually Titan, a large moon of Saturn with potentially liquid water on the surface already. However, the water should freeze, but it doesn't. Because this liquid is mixed with methane and ammonia. But despite this, Titan is the closest place visually that we have ever known to Earth. Eventually, we as humans become a type 2 civilization according to the Kardashev scale, a theoretical scale of power that ranks a civilization where every region of our solar system becomes accessible to us and we can harvest the energy from our own star. Currently today, we're about a 0.78 level civilization. To reach type 1, we need to have access to the power of our entire planet. Eventually, humans will have expanded enough that they'll need to colonize space itself, and O'Neill cylinders will be dotted around the solar system. Potentially, we'll have already sent out a seed ship for another solar system, and as odd as it may seem, even that is already closer than you think, because it's even been theorized to be able to do using old technology. Combining the technology of O'Neill cylinders and Project Orion, interstellar travel would be possible and we would be able to see stars around the galaxy. Or maybe the Earth will have caught us off guard at some point and we may never have the chance to leave Earth at all. But will we just expand to the edges of our ability only to then again find another way to expand further? Or will we be stopped in our tracks by a powerful ancient race of aliens? Which is a strange point to raise here. Will we even find alien life out there? According to the Drake Equation which attempts to define how likely life will occur on other planets in our galaxy. Using the Drake Equation it would seem that life should be everywhere. But from our observations and experience, it's not. Which raises the question of the Fermi Paradox. Why can't we see any of these aliens? Maybe our understanding is too limited to make these equations based on the likelihood of life on other worlds, while we only know of one, Earth. And then to stretch even further and assume intelligent life. There has to be missing information which results that at least intelligent life is rare. Think about sharks. They have been on Earth for 450 million years and they haven't evolved to become more intelligent. They are clever hunters, but beyond that, being a more intelligent shark is not a favourable trait in their evolution. Whereas for a human, it was. In fact, it was the ability to control fire and cook meat that was the first major things we did. More meat was a start, but then cooking meat gave our brains the ability to increase in size and have that evolutionary boost which became favourable. 
Admittedly, nowadays, that can be questionable, but who knows where humans will end up? It is quite possible that we, humans, are the most advanced race in the universe, or at least our own galaxy. If instead of looking at how old the universe is, we just remember how young it actually is. The universe is estimated to end in anywhere between 5 billion years to a Google years, which is 10 to the 100th power. As shown, that's 10 with 100 zeros following it. Now, I'm a bit of an optimist, so I'm going to say that we have a very long time left with our universe. And comparing those numbers with 13.8 billion years, the chances are we are still a newly born universe in comparison to the possibilities. So with the lack of evidence that anyone else is calling out to us, there must be a chance that we are the only life forms that look into space, thinking that somewhere, someone is looking back. Because at some point in time, someone would have had to have been the first, and therefore no one was looking back at them. Maybe this explains the Fermi paradox. One thing we do know is that if we manage to leave Earth, eventually there will at some point be no one left on Earth at all. Even the moon will have gone off on its own adventure, leaving the Earth's gravitational influence. In 20,000 years, the Chernobyl disaster will have cleaned itself up naturally, unless maybe we'd have had the technology to clean it up ourselves before that time. In 50,000 years, this is when we would have to change our clocks to be one second longer because of the moon's pull affecting our spin, which has a dramatic effect, which we have seen throughout this video. In 100,000 years, our solar system would have traveled far enough around the galaxy that the night sky would look vastly different and constellations would not be recognizable. But by this time, Mars could be terraformed and we could potentially see Earth in the night sky with the naked eye. 500,000 years from now, the chances of getting struck by a large asteroid are starting to get higher. An asteroid large enough to temporarily render the atmosphere uninhabitable. By the year 1 million, it has been estimated that we could become a type 3 civilization, according to the Kardashev scale. This means we will have access to the power of our Milky Way galaxy. That is, if humanity survives this long. But if we do, our chances of extinction drops dramatically, as we would need a galactic scale extinction event. However, humans, although might not go extinct, Homo sapiens might, due to evolution, whether natural or artificially occurring, humans may evolve to a new form. Homo nova, if you like. Mars's moon, Phobos, unlike ours which is moving away from the Earth, Phobos is getting closer, and in 50 million years, it is expected to crash into the surface, which, if terraformed and colonized, could be a problem. But I'm sure it's not going to be a problem for a Type 3 civilization to handle. In 100 million years, Saturn is thought to lose its rings, either collected by its moons or Saturn itself, or maybe even ejected from the system. Eventually on Earth, another supercontinent appears, forming Pangaea 2.0, or Pangaea Ultima. While today we're about halfway through this process, which should be completed in 300 million years from now, and is expected to last 200 million years after. By this point in time, new life will have evolved on Earth, and each new era came with some unfathomable creatures, and whether humans have controlled any environmental abnormalities or not, life will still exist and adapt to the world that we create or leave behind. Life started on Earth, and it's very possible that life will all end here as well. There's many possibilities as to what will cause this. Just like with the dinosaurs, as asteroid impacts could potentially cause mass extinctions, but that's not likely to completely destroy all life. However, even though the asteroid that hit the dinosaurs was very large, about 10 to 15 kilometers wide, there are many larger that would cause much more devastation. Or could it be one of the more silent assassins? A gamma ray burst, which are focused beams of gamma radiation. And there are two types of gamma ray bursts, long and short. Long gamma ray bursts last for several hours, and these are shot from stars that go supernova and turn into a black hole. However, short gamma ray bursts last only minutes and are caused by two neutron stars colliding 
which again creates a black hole. Luckily we've only detected these from other galaxies, however if one was to form in our own galaxy, directed towards us, we wouldn't even have a chance to detect it. Travelling at the speed of light, by the time we have detected it, the gamma ray particles would have destroyed our atmosphere and annihilated us even down to our DNA. Don't worry though, the chances of this happening are slim, however it is thought that a gamma ray burst is a likely candidate to have caused a mass extinction in the past. If life has survived on Earth for another 3.8 billion years from now, any life here would be seeing an amazing display in the stars, as the Milky Way collides with the Andromeda Galaxy. And despite the incredible amount of stars and planets in both galaxies, with the space between them, the chances that anything would collide with Earth is unlikely, but it is possible that the gravitational forces of these stars or planets would affect our planet potentially shooting it out of our solar system or disrupting our solar system's orbit so much that Earth becomes the target of anything currently in our solar system. Like Jupiter or even a rogue planet which could pass through our system even before this event which would have a similar effect. If Earth has survived all of this, it won't last forever, so how does Earth finally get taken out? In 800 million years, photosynthesis will stop functioning as CO2 levels are reduced. Which means that oxygen is not being replaced. And you may be thinking about plants here, so we should be safe with the bacteria that I mentioned at the beginning. But like I mentioned, they too use photosynthesis. No CO2 means no oxygen, which means multicellular life would die out here. And that would be the end for us, at least without supported living conditions like habitats or spacesuits, but not for the end of our Earth just yet. Its fate is still set though, as the Sun has been very busy actively supporting life on Earth for billions of years, but now it is running out of fuel. Its core is starting to collapse, but this is happening on the inside. The surface is actually expanding. So much so that Mercury is engulfed, eventually taking Venus as well, and maybe reaching the Earth that could be swallowed by the Sun. This process will happen over a long time and will also give more opportunity because as the sun expands, so does the habitable zone and Mars will be much more habitable than Earth, although its time there will be much shorter than Earth's was. Jupiter's icy moons may potentially become more habitable as time goes on as well, but ultimately the sun is preparing to explode. This is estimated to happen in about 7.5 billion years from now, destroying any celestial objects that are left. What once made our Sun, Earth and all the celestial objects in our solar system are now spreading out into the universe once again, joining other solar systems and maybe what once made Earth will again create a place that will one day harbour life once again. A cycle of death and rebirth of stars and planets. But as odd as it may seem, there is potentially no end to Earth, as its ashes are scattered across the stars. Our tiny planet has already been through such a journey while creating and protecting something even smaller, us. And we one day may learn to harness the power of the universe which wouldn't have been possible without our little Earth. So let's stop killing each other and look after it because the journey has only just begun. From our humble beginnings we will leave Earth behind to find new homes, other beings and while Earth is ultimately consumed it will always be our first home.